Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Coffee Shop Philosophy. As always, I'm your host, Killian Hobbs, Managing Editor for Being Libertarian, LLC. You know our websites. You can follow us on social media. You can follow me directly by searching Killian Hobbs Author on Facebook. And if you so feel inclined, uh, feel free to um, go and visit our Patreon and see some of the different uh, benefits that you can take advantage of there for uh, giving us a little bit of support on the side so we can keep bringing you all the amazing content we do through the Think Liberty Network, um, through the various websites that we're all associated with, and obviously myself personally, if you really enjoy the show. Today's episode, I'm going to jump right into it here. It's a topic that I've discussed previously, uh, however, just not in as full of a degree as I would like. So it's something that um, it's something that I think that I need to give a bit more of an in-depth explanation to. Uh, the thing I want to discuss with you today is the topic of panarchy. So before I before I get right into the, the topic of panarchy, I should uh, clarify a few things, I suppose, for this. Uh, I'm going to go through some of the history, some of the uh, contentions with other ideas. Mainly, though, I'm going to focus on some of the history, how it looks like in its implementation, so on and so forth. I also don't have a guest for this one. I know through historically the previous episodes when I'm discussing a particular idea of some sort or another, I usually have uh, I usually have some form of guest on to join me to help me out with that. But I decided instead that we're just not going to do that for this one because this is a topic that I myself am relatively well versed in. And I'd say that as far as an anarchic society could look, I definitely think that the, the panarchist view is probably the most realistic take or equivalent that we'll achieve. And I'll get into the details as we go into the episode. Uh, so jumping right in here, uh, I wanted to start off with the, the history. So panarchy was a term that was coined um, by a person named Paul Emile de Puit. I think I'm pronouncing the last name wrong. Probably pronouncing it wrong. I should clarify. I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm pronouncing it wrong. P U Y D T. Uh, for those that are interested in searching him up, he wrote about the idea of panarchy based on the concept of being able to freely choose a government, which also includes being able to choose no government whatsoever, as the idea has expanded and evolved over time. So in the, uh, I'll, I'll pull up a quote here. It should be noted that um, I'll just call him as plain as it is. I'll call him Paul just so I don't mess up the last name here. He was a supporter of laissez-faire economics. He was a supporter of individualism and individual rights. Uh, and this is what led him to this philosophy of uh, what they, what you could call extraterritorial government uh, because you should be able to choose a government without having to change your locale. So I'll, I'll take a, uh, I'll take a quote here that he has. The truth is that it is not enough. Uh, sorry. The truth is that there is not enough of the right kind of freedom, the fundamental freedom to choose to be free or not to be free according to one's preference. Thus I demand for each and every member of human society, freedom of association according to inclination and of activity according to aptitude. In other words, the absolute right to choose the political surroundings in which we live and to ask for nothing else. So, as it's pretty clearly stated there, um, I mean, keep in mind, this was back in 1860 that this was coined, that it came up with the initial layout points for this philosophy that's, like I said, expanded. The idea that he has here is to allow people to make the choice to be governed, to not be governed, if they are to be governed by who and how. Uh, I've discussed it uh, on a previous episode when I was joined by Andrew Kern. Uh, we talked about uh, David Friedman. And uh, the book um, Legal Systems Very Different from Ours. And it goes through some of the massive shifts and changes that are just, just completely separate from the type of 
legal systems and concepts of legal systems that we're used to in some of the Western countries here. You should be able to choose which system you wish to be a part of. And that shouldn't involve something like, um, I mean, it costs, I think in the U.S. it costs a little over $2,300 to renounce your citizenship. Then there's also travel costs and actually being able to move entirely from one country to another. That just on, I mean, there's the plane tickets and everything else, of course, but then there's also the cost of moving all of your belongings or you have to go through the process of selling them all and getting rid of them. There's, you know, dealing with real estate or rental agreements or anything else like that that's involved. Contrary to popular belief, it is a very expensive proposition to move to a different country. You shouldn't have to do that if we're truly free. One thing I'll I'll touch on here uh, before I get into more of the ideology itself. Uh, Another another key person in the, I guess you could say, the history of panarchism uh, is Lagrandi Day. And he he described a a pretty similar system, um, which he called uh, multi-government. Uh, there's a very interesting little series of articles on the topic. If you just search for Lagrandi Day or if you search for um, multi-government available on beinglibertarian.com, it goes into far more detail than I'd be able to cover in a single episode, really, uh, at least without missing any of the nuance points or any of the sub-talking points that it can break off into. So I definitely suggest giving that a read if the idea of panarchism is something that appeals to you. But... His concept of multi-governmental systems is very similar in the idea and the scope that there should be a variety to choose from. There should be different frameworks that are available rather than a simple, single framework that's imposed on everybody. Now, one of the things that needs to be clarified with this is that it's not advocating that people get special treatment or some people be above the law or anything like that. One of the key tenets of the concept of the rule of law is the even application of the law. That much is true. However, it's not viewing it in the sense of some people can be immune to the law, but rather some people can be a part of a different legal system. And this would include anarchy. So I'll use uh, I'll use some examples here. When we're talking about, you know, let's say an imagined uh, panarchaic society, let's let's use that as an example here. It wouldn't be like the uh, supposed Encapistan, where you know everything works exactly the way that they say that it'll work in anarcho-capitalist philosophy. It's not going to be some giant commune-type society like with uh, anarcho-communism or even with syndicalism or mutualism. It it doesn't have those types of restrictions to it. Uh, You could say that panarchism is very close to, um, I guess what you could call, black flag anarchism, which is just anarchism without adjectives. However, it differs in the fact that it still accounts for people who want a form of governance. I mean, it doesn't take much to to look around at the political landscape and realize that people who want the government to be removed or people that want a more libertarian society, we are not the majority. We're not the majority by any means. I mean, granted, In the U.S. alone, they say there's about 30 to 60 million people who have libertarian or libertarian-leaning views. That said, though, not a whole lot of them are going to end up voting for libertarians or participating in any type of libertarian-type action that could actually lead to the reduction of state. And America's always been unique in its views on independence and personal rights and its very individualist origins. Most other countries don't share that exact same viewpoint. Um, I mean, even if uh, you look at 
well, China is a great example for that, I suppose. Um, but even if you look into different countries like um, Japan, you look into uh, Russia, you look across Europe, a lot of the countries, you know, they they don't view it as they don't view the government as a horrible, terrible thing like it's viewed in the United States. Or at least if they do view it as a terrible thing, they view it still very necessary. They still view the importance of civic duty very highly. And they do, in general, believe that the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few, which is something that is not necessarily contrary, but let's just say it's not as common of a belief in the United States as it is elsewhere. That all said, though, in a panicist society, that's not an issue. You can still have people who are part of different governments that are formed or are adherent to specific legal systems of their choosing, but then they're bound to those legal systems. They can have a government or governmental type organization that provides all of the different needs that they're looking for the government to provide or to have a governmental type organization provide, such as um, policing, EMS, et cetera, et cetera. They can have that still. That's still an option. And yet the rest of us would still be able to be free. One thing that we, we don't like talking about when it comes to the concept of anarchy is that if you establish an anarchist society, like let's say, you know, let's say we don't magically change everyone's mind about the government and get everyone on board with the complete abolition of government. I mean, we can't even get every we we don't even have the majority of libertarians agreeing with the abolishment of government. The majority of libertarians are either classical liberals or minarchists. Even in libertarian circles, anarchists are the minority. So we're not going to convince everybody of that. It's just it's not going to happen. The closest that we could get following that train of thought would be the slow repeal of the government that could lead to people saying, okay, well, if we could go without A, B, C, D, and E, then maybe we can get rid of F and G and so on and so forth. More realistically, though, if anarchy were to be achieved, it would most likely happen through violent revolution of some sort. I mean, we've all seen the memes regarding the kickstarting the boogaloo, as uh, <laughs> some people like to refer to it as. I think there was a... It sounds bad because it's there's there's so many of them that I have trouble keeping up sometimes. But I think there was a uh, Liberty Bites episode where uh, William Gatson dressed up like a clown and did a little video for us uh, a couple weeks back um, where he talks about that concept a little bit. But even if we were to go that route and there was, let's say, some group were to rise up and there was, supposed to, there was a massive revolution and basically a coup that took over the government and then immediately dissolved the damn thing. Well, people are still going to want a government of some sort. So either they're going to willingly get a whole bunch of people to take on the power, or they're going to be forced to live under anarchic conditions. Think about how that means. Like, think about what that means. That means that they're, that even though it's anarchy, you know, it's the supposed maximum freedom that a person could have, they're being forced forced to go without something they want. This is the, this is an issue that people have, uh, people on the like right libertarian side, or at least supporters of laissez-faire uh, economics have against anarcho-communists. The idea that you can't have hierarchies in business or the idea that you can't have markets. If you are talking to someone who believes in full on gift economies, one of the big pushes that we have is being able to say, well, no, I want to have, you know, the concept of property rights. Well, the concept of property rights are restrictive. It lays down a foundation of what someone owns, what someone doesn't own, and it creates basically a line of being able to tell people what to do as far as your property is concerned. I personally think that that's a good thing, and it's an element that's going to be pretty much necessary in order to have a functioning collective of humans just about anywhere is drawing some boundary lines, but 
even in the same sense. We want the ability to have those restrictions exist. We're not asking, of course, just for ourselves to have our own private property. We want everyone to be able to have private property. And we want to have those boundaries in place. We want to have those restrictions existing. So when we argue against anarcho-communists, we're arguing in favor of having a pre-existing restriction of some sort. If we were to create a society that is, say, anarcho-capitalist, and it came from some sort of revolution of some sort where, you know, a small group of people, or at least a relatively small in percentages to total population anyway, ended up taking control and enforcing anarchy. Well, those people that want those types of restrictions wouldn't have them. Sure, we, we have, you know, the concept of... Uh, market-provided um, security agencies and uh, even the concept of privatized legal systems or tribunals or um, arbitrators. or There's tons of different theories on how that aspect could work. The point, though, is the fact that if it happens that way, then we're enforcing that on people because at that point we're creating some form of societal rule that other people need to conform with. And it sounds strange to hear the idea that people have to conform with anarchy. It sounds almost counterintuitive. But realistically, any political system, including the permanent absence of it, is a form of enforced conformity. Because if there is no option for those that want the alternative, then they're not truly free because they're being restricted in that sense. They're not being allowed to form governments of their own or allowed to have those types of restrictions put on them if they so choose. So going back to the uh, going back to the quote there, like you said, the fundamental freedom to choose to be free or not to be free according to one's own preference. A lot of people like the idea of there being some form of government or some sort of legal system that exists with the panarchy solution. It will. In the ideas of panarchy, you can have it where, yes, these people can be a part of this government and they can have a tax system and they can have these different services that are provided by this government without it being geographically locked. So it's not based on where you live. It's based on who you choose to be aligned with, if you will, who you choose to enter into that kind of agreement with where you can have these types of interactions. Now, granted, there are some issues with the concept of panarchy. One of the obvious issues is if you have people from people that are represented by two different types of governing agencies that have some sort of a dispute. Right now, we see that kind of issue with um, international law as far as, say, a citizen from one country breaks a law in a different country there's an entire web of international law that's related to that outside of just the one nation's law. Panarchy can sidestep this a little bit, though, because any of the people that are going to be in those types of systems, there's going to be a question of where and a question of to who, in which case there's going to be some sort of resolution system that will basically work its way out. Uh, a good example of this would be you know, you're not going to have a, uh, I'll backtrack here, you're not going to have a situation where, say, someone joins up with some form of government and the, they say that it's perfectly legal to kill people outside of your government. They're not going to say that because if they were stupid enough to do that, then anyone that's associated with the surrounding one would probably take up the same accord just to get rid of them. Because if they're prepping themselves up that way, then that means that they're encouraging their citizens to go and actively take over lands, basically. Mutually assured destruction would take place if that happened and the so the so called dreaded faction wars of anarchy would take place at that point. But even then, even if that concept were to come about, well I I people just aren't that psychotic. 
And even if the ones that are, if you get enough of them together, it gets silenced and dampened. It's, it's how we as a human race, like how the human race has survived this long, is that the, the one-off psychopaths get silenced and dampened over time. So, I mean, that kind of issue, I, I mention it as an issue, but it's not, I don't see it as a long-term issue. Like with any type of, you know, paradigm shift like this, you're going to have growing pains. If you had a massive shift over to communism or a massive shift over to actual anarcho-capitalism or you were to push the, the Rothbard button and get rid of pretty much every market restriction and consumer protection that exists, it's going to be a bad time for a little while. <laughs> That's one thing that uh, in all of the talk about anarchy never really gets addressed is the fact that it takes time for markets to adjust. It takes time for people to adjust. It takes time for all of these things to come into play. So a lot of the issues that panarchy can have aren't really against panarchy, but are more or less just part of paradigm shifts in general. One thing that's worth noting, though, is some of the issues that it solves. So as I've mentioned already, it solves the issue of people who want a form of governance while other people don't. One of the, I guess one of the, the issues, I should go back a bit here, one of the issues that would be kind of unaddressed would be what takes place when you have, uh, would be what takes place when you have people who are living in quote unquote anarchy in the system. And there's some sort of crime or something like that that takes place against somebody that's part of some form of multi-governmental organization or some part of one of the competing jurisdictional uh, jurisdictions. Again, it's one of those things where there would have to be a case of it for it to work out, for us to actually figure out what this means and where it could go and how it would, how it would be documented there's a lot of theoreticals that could go around about how that potential situation could be solved. Uh, I'll save that for either a later episode or a, a different uh, con like a different topic later on, maybe an article of some sort down the road, but I'm not going to take up all your time with them here uh, solving that one particular issue than a series of hypotheticals. Going into the positives though, one of the, one of the big upsides, like I mentioned, is the fact that it cures, the, like it deals with people who want a government. But it also fixes the issue of competing anarchist philosophies. So, I mean, a great example, um, I've seen this in debate groups all the time, is, you know, the, the adage that you can't have anarcho-capitalism in anarcho-communism but you can have anarcho-communism in anarcho-capitalism. The reason being is that anarcho-communism gets rid of the concept of private property entirely. And in most iterations of it that I've seen discussed, it gets rid of concepts of markets in general as well, because it usually asks for either some form of gift economy in large portions of it, uh, or outside of the gift economy one, it's, more so everybody just kind of working purely for themselves, in which case you can have markets, but then you're more in mutualist territory than you are in pure communist territory. In anarcho-capitalism, you still have property rights, which means that people can still own land. Thus, people can pool their land together and form communes and get rid of markets internally and instead just have that type of communal system if they so choose. With panarchy, you can have both. With panarchy, if people choose to get together and have some form of communal living, then they can do so. If people would rather participate in some form of capitalistic ventures and have that type of society going on, they can choose to do so. They can choose to be a part of that type of society. One thing that panarchy isn't 100% clear on half the time is its absolute take on property rights. Um, like I said, the, the founder of it, many of the economists that find themselves uh, in favor of the system do tend to also support the concept of property rights, uh, at least as we understand them today, which is the concept of private property 
rather than dividing up personal property and uh, uh, productive property or uh, absentee ownership or any of that sort of stuff, just treating it all as private property so that there's some sort of systemization with it, which is the only way to actually separate people out. The concept of private property, or at least something near to it, would be foundational in creating this idea of panarchy. In other words, you reach panarchy if you take the idea of anarcho-capitalism and individualism to its zenith. If you're taking the idea of people being free as the full meaning, take it to the like nth degree of what a person being free is. And you throw in the fact that if we're going to have land and land ownership and people have the rights to choose these different things, that they're going to have the right to choose different systems. They're going to have the right to choose different ideas. And if that includes wanting, for God knows what reason, wanting to be a part of some sort of governmental system and having that over them, then they should have the right to be able to do that. It shouldn't be in the place or people shouldn't hold the power to tell those people no if it doesn't affect them. It's only when one of these systems or one of these ideas comes to impact you that you should have a say on it. Now, before people misconstrue what I'm saying there, I'm not saying that, you know, turn a blind eye to injustices and or anything, you know, super silly like that. I'm not saying that, you know, because it doesn't affect you, you can't have a stance on something like the so, the horrific social credit system that they've got in China or, um, you know, the goings on in UK politics or anything like that. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that by any means. What I am saying, though, is that If other people are making choices for themselves, if we've established a form of free society and people are making these choices for themselves and those choices do not harm anyone else other than them, than themselves, then they should be free to do that. We can disagree with a decision. We can decide that the decision that they're picking is, well, relatively stupid if we so think so, but they still should have the right to do it. Uh, unless and up until, of course, it has some sort of negative impact on other people. Then we can talk about some of the, you know, about curving some of that behavior. Now, the last thing I want to say on the the topic of panarchy here is realistically, when we're getting to when we're getting into a more advanced society. And what I mean here is the fact that, you know, technologically we're evolving the way that we view social issues and the like minute that we're getting into with social issues. And contrary to popular belief, the almost hyper awareness that people have to the actual state of the way things are. As we're advancing as a society, either socially, culturally, technologically, economically, et cetera, et cetera, I have a feeling that panarchy is pretty much the way that we will end up going. Because so long as the concepts of freedom and individualism and even just personal responsibility remain, as long as they exist and we advance, we'll advance towards getting away from having one all-imposing body to having some separated ideas. I mean, we've had this before. We've had, you know, full-on kingdoms and city-states. We've had this, this separation before. I mean, we have this separation now. It's just that each version lords over the ones underneath it. You know, the municipal government gets lorded over by the state government, gets lorded over by the federal government. Dealing with different forms of governance is something that we're all used to. If we 
get to a certain point, though, we'll actually realize that. And I think in realizing that, that'll be one of the biggest push points to get us close to anarchy versus anything else that we've been trying. I mean, even if you just look at, say, you know, the Internet is a great example of this. Uh, a lot of people think of the Internet as lawless chaos, but I mean, almost every website you go to has some form of terms and conditions that it has to follow and abide by, or at least I should say that the users have to follow and abide by. And outside of the, I guess you could call them the main websites, which would be, you know, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, I mean, really that's it. Oh, YouTube. Those would be the the kind of the big four, if you will. Outside of those, completely different rules apply. Some places are more restrictive. Some places are less restrictive. I mean, all of these different options are there, and you can spend your time on any of the different forums that are out there and at different platforms and do things completely differently outside of the governing rules of these main websites. I know that might seem like a bit of a stretch as far as an analogy is concerned, but I mean... There's some people who, you know, they, they live on Facebook or they live on Twitter, basically. But they can switch that and end up following a completely different set of rules if they so choose. That same principle of being able to switch over to a different platform or switch over and have the freedom to kind of change and to choose and to move on, that's what I think will be the biggest appealing point with Panarchy. And I think that realistically, if we're ever going to get towards a form of anarchy, we're going to need a form of anarchy that allows people to choose to participate in governance. Because as it stands, we just don't win enough people over to the cause of full-on anarchy because of how many things are left unaddressed and how little people like uncertainty. People do not enjoy uncertainty. And no matter the degree or depth that we explain anarchist philosophy to, it's not going to be enough to get people to shake that feeling. Because that's what it really boils down to is how they just feel about the matter. All that said, though, I think the, the biggest takeaway point when it comes to the concept of panarchy is that it gives us probably the most realistic view of what an anarchistic society would actually look like. We can use all of the, you know, Caruso examples that we want to try to explain exactly how anarcho-capitalism would work or explain how mutualism would look or explain how anarcho-transhumanism or anarcho-primitivism or any of the different anarchist philosophies. I mean, if you actually just search up types of anarchy and you'll find a list eventually and there are hundreds of different subschools of anarchy that are available out there. Out of them all, though, I would honestly say that panarchy is probably the closest to what would realistically happen because we have such a diversity of political thought across the spectrum, not just in our country, but in every country, that if we were to achieve this system, it would accommodate those people while still giving us all more freedom than we have under every any given singular state. I think I covered just about everything I wanted to cover in today's episode, so I'll, I'll just wrap everything up here by saying that uh, it's definitely a topic that I heavily suggest people look into and use it to compare against your own philosophy and see how it could fit in, how it doesn't fit in. If it doesn't fit in, why not? What are the differences? If you have any questions about the topic or if you have any ideas about topics for future episodes, uh, do feel free to message me directly through the uh, Killian Hobbs author page uh, that you can find on Facebook there. Uh, that's the social media person where I choose to live. Again, episodes come out every Thursday, as you already know. Uh, also, I don't mention this often enough. Definitely check out the other episode, uh, the other shows that are available on the podcast network here. Uh, even if you just tune in on Thursdays for my show, there are other great shows that uh, do come out. Uh, Liberty Bites on Mondays, the main Think Liberty podcast on Tuesdays, 
Uh, Amagi is usually out on Wednesdays. Some weeks they miss, but they're usually out on Wednesdays. And then um, the Political Circus uh, weekend kind of news roundup uh, shows up every Saturday as well. Uh, so, with all that said, as always, if you liked what you heard and you'd like to hear more, I'll see you again next week. <laughs> <laughs>